Hello um, and uh, welcome to the Metec Europe session, the power of health data and tele tele telemonitoring, driving innovation and empowering citizens and patients at the eHealth Summit of the Portuguese Presidency. We're delighted um, to be here and we're so grateful for the organizers to give us an opportunity um, for this session. Um, today, um, uh, maybe a word about Medtech Europe. Um, we are the trade association for the medical technology industry, including diagnostics, medical devices, and digital health. We have our headquarters in Europe, in Brussels, and we um, are delighted to be part of many stakeholder initiatives in digital health. Um, let's talk today about remote patient monitoring technologies. Um, Remote page patient monitoring technologies, um, they're also sometimes called telemonitoring, um, facilitate monitoring and treatment delivery to patients outside the settings of primary and secondary care. So you can have your doctor over distance. Um, this is all done with the help of smart and connected devices that process data, health data, that will empower patients to manage their conditions and also enable healthcare professionals to manage and coordinate their care for patients. Um, as a result, we believe, uh, and it's been proven in many studies, that uh, this results in better quality of care, improved well-being of patients. It improves access, particularly for remote, uh, remote regions in, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, so there's, there's actually, um, there, there are no downsides, really, we think, um, uh, for remote patient monitoring. It, um, and in addition to that, all of this health data can be put to good use. When we aggregate and examine this health data, we can identify population health trends. We can um, develop new scientific and medical insights, um, innovate new products and services, and improve diagnostics and treatments. However, there are some barriers that need to be addressed, and those are what we want to talk about today. So I welcome today um, our three distinguished speakers, um, Justine Vandenbosch, Christoph Schöbel, and Marta de Cunha. Um, and um, I think we're going to start in, um, this, this session with Justine, who is Director Governments, uh, Government Affairs at, Met, at ResMed in Brussels. Um, for those of you with the time, you can stop now and read her complete biography. <laughs> and with that, I would like to hand over to you, Justine, and you just tell me when to advance your slides. Thank you very much, Michael, and thank you for the excellent introduction of remote patient monitoring, which is a really a key part of my presentation. And I also want to thank the Portuguese presidency for dedicating this session on digital health and for having me as a speaker. So, uh, Michael, I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation. Um, so, ResMed's mission is really uh, to pioneer innovative solutions that keep people out of the hospital. So. As you mentioned before, Michael, our main aim is to treat patients in the home or community setting, empowering them to live healthier and high, higher quality lives. And we do this by um, providing patients with digital health technologies and cloud connected medical devices to primarily treat sleep apnea and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And we also have technologies that <clears throat> uh, monitor asthma. Uh, we also have out-of-hospital software platforms, where, which enable uh, community care settings to create efficiencies and uh, manage electronic health records. And we sell products in over 140 countries. We have 7,500 employees and we're uh, headquarters in San Diego with significant um, operations in Sydney, Singapore, as well as France. Next slide. So this is our digital health ecosystem. Uh, most of our devices are uh, centered in the home and the patient is the key user of our CPAP machines and ventilators, which are now uh, connected um, through the internet. And then the data that is generated by the devices through the patient's use um, is then uh, held in the health data host, which is our AirView system, which is the cloud platform where most of our patient and device data goes. And then that is accessible through the internet um, by the physician and the home care provider. So um, our patients are mostly managed through a middle party called the home care provider, which uh, not only provides the um, appropriate devices to the patient, but they also manage the patient through our cloud platform. So ResMed really manufactures the devices and then 
uh, provides a lot of the control of the patient to the physician and the home care providers. Um, so next slide, please. So this is all done in the vision of what digital health can really do for our patients and communities. And um, it really promises to make healthcare better, safer, more efficient, and advance the delivery of high quality care by improving access to care and care equity. So in today's context, um, obviously with the COVID crisis, um, there's been a general shortage of healthcare resources. And we find that digital health can really meet some of that uh, gap right now, given that patients are able to be monitored through digital health solutions. And then uh, doctors and healthcare providers need to spend less time with personal visits. Um, these solutions also enable more efficiency of care delivery and improve quality and efficacy, and also are able to um, improve on safety. So in order for this digital health vision to really um, succeed, we really need to unlock the benefits of health data because that is the fuel that um, basically <clears throat> enables the digital health solutions to succeed and also to uh, create new ways of personal management. Uh, so patients are able to not only um, have more empowered ways of uh, looking and treating them themselves, but also um, providing more uh, insights to directly to the healthcare provider. And this will ultimately accelerate the transition toward value-based healthcare, which is really incentivizing all the parties to focus more on the outcome, the positive outcome for the patient, rather than just performing the task. Um, so ultimately our vision of digital health is to lead to value-based healthcare, which is applied and evolving consistently across healthcare system, which is still um, a, an ambition. So uh, next slide, please. So these are the six ways where health data and digital health can really create value for the patient and the healthcare system. So obviously, um, if the data is uh, electronic, it's much more easy to share and make available. So uh, it can be easily exchanged and provided quickly and easily by the devices if we have the right environment, which is interoperable. Um, second is patient self-management and empower, empowerment. So uh, if patients have more access to data that accurately and timely reflects uh, their therapy and their condition, it then it empowers them to, um, to monitor this, but also to change their behaviors. And if this their own health data is um, combined with other data from environmental factors, um, they can also get more insights, for example, in medical device um, <clears throat> apps. And this will improve their sense of control and quality of life of, of treatment. Uh, remote patient monitoring is the main topic of, of our discussion today. And I have a separate slide on that. So I will discuss that uh, in a separate slide. Um, Data-driven healthcare. So this will, uh, this is really about how healthcare organizations and the medtech industry use data to standardize procedures, improve on consistency, reduce error, improve efficiencies, and um, enable monitoring of performance to make healthcare more transparent. Um, and then monitoring device performance, this is really in the auspices of the medical device regulation, which is going to come shortly in, in place where Manufacturers are able to basically monitor the performance, safety, um, and effectiveness of their devices once they're out there in the market. And obviously, uh, real-world evidence and real-world data that is collected uh, in a timely manner enables this to be more quick and efficient. Uh, and then data analytics. Uh, so this is probably the most future-oriented um, uh, ability where uh, Data from parameters and environmental states can be um, combined with health data and then applied by advanced analytics to provide more insights for innovation and also for uh, improving treatments and outcomes. Next slide, please. 
so really this the remote patient monitoring is really our key um, activity that we we um, enable with our devices but also our cloud platform and the the devices uh, that are connected uh, are able to deliver uh, information on physiological parameters how the treatment is going through the device and how the patient is using the device um, so we are able to monitor that through our healthcare providers. And then the healthcare providers are there, therefore able to, on the other side, um, to look into the, the device performance, the usage by the patient, and then manage and coordinate care for their patients um, in a remote setting. And this will also um, help the healthcare providers understand how the protocol works, but I'll leave that uh, to Crystal Schobel to expand on in his presentation next. Um, so in the respite setting, we have the sleep apnea and um, respiratory care devices, uh, with, such as ventilators and high flow therapy devices. And today, <clears throat> those devices through the health data that, we, that they generate help us detect poor compliance. They also help us detect poor therapy efficacy if there's something wrong with the, the mask, for example, that's not delivering enough of the treatment, then we are able to adjust that. And then this will uh, help us trigger some of the customized changes that needs, need to be made in the therapy setup. Um, so in a related study, we actually proved that um, telemonitoring, so remote patient monitoring, out of a cohort of 6,800 two patients, um, our CPAP devices, which are connected uh, through remote monitoring, uh, helped reduce the termination of CPAP therapy by over 50%. Um, so this is in comparison to not connected devices where the patient um, gathers the data in, a, uh, in just an SD card and then they keep most of the, um, the data to themselves. So, it also improves adherence and helps the uh, patient kind of feel accountable to the treatment. So for the second uh, solution we have, it's our propeller um, health system, which is basically a uh, connected inhaler uh, uh, sensor, which also helps through the ability of, of digital connectivity, helps to detect poor compliance, also detect increasing usage of rescue drugs, and then can also trigger customized intervention to reduce exasperations. And we found that uh, propeller uh, health solutions have actually reduced hospitalization of, of patients because of the uh, continued feedback from our uh, sensors about dosing and also management. Justin, we need to um, ask you to come to a, um, to, to come to a, Okay, great. I will do that. So um, the so basically the other chart on the right is really about talking what the health data potential is for tomorrow, in terms of identifying patients at risk and re enriching some of this data that's generated with other forms of data, and then moving from a um, corrected healthcare to preventative healthcare. So next slide, please. So really I've reached my conclusion. Um, this chart on the left is really about how value-based healthcare can be developed through the enabling of health data and uh, digital solutions. And uh, also at the moment, manufacturers are still kind of struggling to make the leap toward the secondary use of data because we do not have uh, access to the device data that's generated. So really the, there needs to be some regulatory hurdles and legal challenges uh, addressed in order for us to make the best out of digital healthcare uh, solutions and enabling the health data to, to help us innovate further and help with uh, value-based healthcare outcomes. Um, and we find that the current proposal for the European health data space has the potential to solve this for us. And um, that's all I have for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justine. I'm almost right in time. Um, and I think we'll talk more about um, the regulatory hurdles and others. Um, and I think Christoph also is planning to talk a little bit about them. With that, um, then I would like to hand over to Christoph Schöbel. Schöbel is, uh, uh, Christoph is Professor for Sleep and Telemedicine at Essen University Hospital. And uh, Christoph, the floor is yours. 
Yeah, thank you, Michael, for introduction. Uh, so perhaps the next one at first. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that there are enormous opportunities in digitalization of medicine and especially now the coronavirus can really be seen as a digital meteorite strike. The little virus has catalyzed digital development in a way never seen before. In particular, health data measured by new sensors can indeed help us rethinking health. Please the next one. As you can see here, for instance, there are various apps and sensors capable to measure vital data, for instance, during sleep. Especially sleep exhibit an optimal test field as vital data are not that much influenced by physical and mental influences compared to wake state. Thus, we are able to perform a real long-term monitoring for time series analysis. And as sleep can be called a seismograph for our health state, we could use those data not only to diagnose for sleep disorders, but to detect for changes of our health in very early ways. Next one. The problem is due to missing evidence, we know that we cannot rely on every sensor with certainty. We need to know whether a sensor is addressing necessary issues to be certified as medical product according to the European Medical Device Regulation, which has been introduced this May. On the next slide, you can see the key changes uh, according uh, to uh, the other laws and what is new regarding the NDR. So this, we skip to the next one. Because we know from chronic heart failure, which is an example to show how medical data can indeed help us managing patients with chronic diseases. Thanks to randomized controlled trials, we know that data sent by implantable cardiac devices or by the diagnostic tools like body scale, blood pressure monitoring, or pulse oximetry, these data can be used to detect deteriorations of heart failure in early ways. Thus, therapy can be optimized to prevent hospitalizations and even to improve mortality. Next one. Same is true for patients with sleep apnea, as Justine has mentioned, who need to wear a mask for positive airway pressure therapy to prevent the collapses of the upper airways during sleep. We know that compliance is a big issue. That means Positive effects of such therapy can only be expected when wearing the mask for a specific amount of time each night. Data sent remotely by the machine can be used to detect patients struggling with their therapies in order to address and solve their problems in an early way. The next slide you can see that it has been shown that telemonitoring can indeed help us in order to increase compliance rates of patients and to reduce therapy termination rates over long term. Next one. The best thing is that the remotely transmitted data can be also reflected as a feedback to the patient via a special app, for instance. As patients get feedback on their health data, they are empowered to act as an equal partner considering decision-making processes. And this will optimize therapy adherence in a way never seen before. On the next slide, you can see another example for telemonitoring, which is non-invasive ventilation therapy. This therapy has shown to reduce mortality in patients with chronic lung diseases like COPD. Also non-invasion ventilation devices can send data which we can use to assess the efficacy of the therapy and also possibly to detect worsenings of the disease. At the moment, this technique is really helping us to have regular therapy controls without having those high risk patients in clinics during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. The problem is that all those solutions presented so far will only show their whole potential if combined together in a smart healthcare pathway, integrating clinical data and also data from diagnostic and therapy devices. On the next slide, you see that hopefully future electronic health records like the one planned in Germany will exhibit such integrated solution. We have to wait whether this is fulfilling. 
On the next slide, you can see new concepts for data-driven research because the amount of data offers new chances for data-driven research. As with tools of medical data science, new pattern can be uncovered, helping us to understand interactions of different health problems on a more individual level. Also, questions of data donation and data inheritance should be addressed. Next one. The problem is always be aware of data protection, data security, and for sure, everything we are talking about should follow the European General Data Protection Regulation. On the next slide, you see what is our common goal. We should keep in mind that regardless of any data we are using, the patients should remain in the center of our focus. For this, medical data should help us to improve the quality of healthcare regarding patient-centered outcomes while reducing costs. And finally, we will only achieve the goal, like you see on the next slide, if medical decisions are made jointly by physicians and informed patients as the future lies in the de democratization of medicine. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm very curious on the discussion afterwards. Thank you, Christoph. This has been uh, really, uh, really short and punchy and, uh, and to the point. And I look forward to spending a little bit more time in the discussion talking about COVID-19, co co talking about compliance and so forth. Let's go to our next and final presenter. We're now going to transition from um, sleep apnea, from respiratory diseases to a different um, and, of course, um, very important um, uh, condition, which is diabetes. Um, we have we welcome Marta de Cunha Maluf Borgman um, from Medtronic. She is Regulatory Affairs Manager for Digital Health at Medtronic. Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for this opportunity to, to show uh, the importance of data in, for our business and more important for our patients. Um, I can start by, by, next please. I can start by showing what, what is Medtronic. Our company is a world's largest medical device te te technology and solutions company with 20 operating units nowadays. We have presence in more than 150 countries and have 75 manufacturing sites worldwide. Our employees are reaching the a number of almost 100,000. Uh, among them, we come with more than 10,000 engineers and scientists uh, worldwide. Last year, we invested uh, $2.3 billion, and we are going to continue investing in new therapies and solutions uh, where therapy innovation, globalization, and economic value are the, pil pi the pillars of our uh, business strategy. Our company covers therapies for more than 20 diseases and conditions, uh, which represent um, that uh, the two People every second uh, are improving their lives or, uh, with our therapies and services. But more than products, we have integrated health solutions that are transforming the healthcare via the value-based healthcare concept and via public-private par uh, partnerships as well. Next, please. One of our operating units is the diabetes group which is working hard creating new ways of continued glucose monitoring system with hybrid closed loop systems, for example, and state-of-the-art sensors and smart pens as uh, examples of, of innovation that uh, are integrated with mobile monitoring tools and capabilities and allowed an easy management of the glucose levels in the blood. This is a, the data is a, a key element for diabetes solutions. Next, please. The data management systems uh, al allows the patients to access their data and see the same reports as their doctors uh, can see. And also the patient can collaborate on their own healthcare management. So here we uh, provide them empowerment, eh? empowerment to the patients. The healthcare providers and caregivers also can see the data at real time at all moment. Next, please. 
A new way to manage the multiple daily injections is uh, through smart insulin pens, also called smart CGM solutions, which are insulin pens that don't require sacrificing data and provide decision support. This kind of solutions enhance multiple daily injections management because have the capability to track data in real time by offering personalized doses recommendations, which can be followed through mobile applications. Next, please. A daily diabetes routine represents a struggle with each meal for a diabetes patient. Service and statistics show among many of the services available in, uh, uh, in the scientific com community, those show that 76% of patients feel the card counting as a burdensome activity in a typical week. Other patients miss two meals bolus per week. Two thirds of the patients underestimate carbs. But continuous glucose monitoring reduces the fear of hypoglycemia and improves other uh, psychological metrics in, par in parents and children with type one diabetes. This is important for the, for the infant, for the children with diabetes one. CGS, CGM systems have the potential to reduce the disease burden for patients and their families as well. Next, please. In a study related to, to uh, remote monitoring with, with continuous glucose monitoring system uh, in, in children with type 1 diabetes mellitus, um, uh, the study resulted uh, on, uh, on conclusions from the parent's perspective and emerged that the CGM uh, has an impact on sleep quality for the parents, gives peace of mind, improve the, uh, and give impact on the anxiety of the parents and children, uh, provide freedom and confidence for parents and children, and impacting the relationship. So we are talking about psychological and such, such sociological positive impact for, for the entire family. And furthermore, parents reported on themes related to CGM in general, uh, such as better understanding on how to manage and control the child's uh, diabetes and experiences related to physical or technical aspects uh, on the solutions. As a conclusion, the, the studies uh, um, um, shows that overall, the parents of primary school children reported that using remote monitoring and CGM solutions was a most beneficial experience for them. Other benefits of CGM can, uh, we can mention is related to the benefits in hospital environment. A CGM is more appropriate and adds value for patients with complex insulin regimes. To conclude the road of the CGM and remote monitoring, we transited from, from a manual therapy management that implied card counting, meal estimation, or fixed doses, uh, with all the burden that created for patients and caregivers, to what we have today with remote and mobile applications that can track the sugar levels and, notif and provide notification to the patients and the care partners or everyone in the loop where multiple people can receive notification from the insulin pump, for example, or the smart pen. We foresee a future where the automated uh, personalized therapy management and monitoring will be the rule that will continue with, a, uh, uh, with a, the better quality of life for uh, diabetes patients. To conclude with my presentation, I would like to share a video which illustrates the benefits of CGM and remote monitoring for the patients. Ho scoperto di avere il diabete a 19 anni e avevo perso più di 15 kg in pochissimi mesi. Io mi sono sentito scaraventato in un mondo che non era il mio, che non conoscevo e che, e che mi faceva anche paura. Il diabete tipo 1 
è una malattia caratterizzata dalla pressoché totale eh, assenza di secrezione insulinica da parte delle cellule eh, beta del pancreas. L'insulina è un ormone molto importante per l'organismo perché regola la concentrazione di glucosio nel sangue. Le persone diabetiche non hanno un meccanismo di autocontrollo per abbattere e per trasformare questi zuccheri in energia per i muscoli. Per poter riuscire ad avere una compensazione dello zucchero nel sangue sono obbligato a iniettare manualmente dell'insulina all'interno del mio corpo. La terapia multinettiva ha richiesto un grosso adattamento nella mia vita. Fare diverse iniezioni di insulina al giorno dovevo necessariamente ad esempio calcolare il valore dei carboidrati che assumevo durante i pasti per poter trasformare questi carboidrati in zuccheri. Non è mai stato facile da gestire. L'attività sportiva influisce moltissimo sulla vita di un diabetico perché richiede una maggiore energia, quindi hai assolutamente la necessità di mangiare più carboidrati e di fare la giusta quantità di insulina affinché il tuo fisico abbia la benzina per poter fare quello che stai facendo. Senza insulina la glicemia tenderebbe a risalire oltre soglie di normalità e l'esposizione cronica ad elevati valori di glicemia può determinare la comparsa di complicazioni vascolari. I microinfusori di cui sentivo parlare non mi hanno mai convinto perché richiedevano comunque la presenza di un'azione manuale da parte del, del paziente. Questa cosa qui mi ha sempre spinto ad evitare di fare qualunque prova. In un viaggio aereo ho incontrato una persona che conoscevo già da anni che mi ha appunto parlato di questa nuova tipologia di microinfusori che utilizzavano un particolare algoritmo che ti consentiva di avere un controllo automatico della glicemia per 24 ore in continuo. Questa cosa mi ha molto interessato. So Medtronic's latest insulin pump uh, works with uh, an algorithm uh, that monitors what the glucose level or a sugar level of a patient is and then automatically includes the amount of insulin they need Uh, to match up with their demand. And so essentially, we're trying to alleviate a lot of the uh, decision making that a person with diabetes will have on a day-to-day -day basis um, by making that automatic and easy. A me piace fare kite, sap, andare in spiaggia con la famiglia. Il microinfusore mi ha consentito di affrontare questo tipo di attività con maggiore sicurezza. What makes it unique is that uh, a person with diabetes now doesn't have to go through the struggles of getting their carbohydrate counting perfect. What they can do is allow the system to make up for whatever errors they may see. In addition to that, we've taken out all of the guesswork of how much insulin they're going to need, giving them peace of mind to not have to worry about if they are going to go way too low or way too high because the system accommodates for that also. Il microinfusore riesce a iniettare delle piccole dosi di insulina e mi consente di verificare qual è lo stato della glicemia di averlo in tempo reale, cioè prendo il mio smartphone, apro un'app e lì ho tutte le informazioni. Time in range è il tempo che una persona diabetica riesce a trascorrere con i valori glicemici contenuti all'interno di un intervallo ottimale. Da quando uso questo nuovo microinfusore ci sono dei giorni in cui ho anche il 100%. What we have done here is eliminated the need for constant injections. The goal of a fully closed loop uh, system to mimic a healthy pancreas is within the window of 5 to 10 years. Medtronic's ultimate goal in diabetes therapy is for people with diabetes to forget they have it. È bello vivere tutte queste esperienze in sicurezza. Questa tecnologia ha migliorato la qualità della mia vita e mi ha aiutato a superare tutti i limiti.
Okay, wow, thank you very much, uh, Marta, for, for sharing this powerful video to us that give, really gives a, a sense of, of the human dimension of diabetes and the power of technology and what data can do for us. Um, we would like to now go into the discussion and I would like to um, really, I'm being lazy today, I would like to um, uh, ask you whether you actually have uh, questions for each other, um, uh, one of you. Yeah, so uh, thank you, Michael. And this was a really interesting uh, set of presentations. And I'd like to reference Christoph Schobel's presentation and specifically the slide on the general data protection regulation where he said that all of the data is being used and accessed uh, according to the GDPR. And of course, currently in the policy discussions, the GDPR is of top interest uh, in these health data and data access discussions. Um, so the European regulators want to enable the European health data space, but they have some nervousness around uh, what you know, is going to happen to the data and whether patients are really going to be protected in terms of uh, being uh, giving access to their data and, and sharing it for, for their research. Um, so on the kind of healthcare provider perspective, what is your take in terms of your patient's uh, experience in their willingness to share their data for further secondary use and research on their particular disease state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Justine, thank you for the question. And for sure, um, every patient is interested to improve his or her health status, especially if there is a chronic disease. And uh, we know that patients are willing to share their data and they are willing to share if they know what uh, what is uh, what what is done with the data. So especially regarding feedback of results of um, scientific purposes, for instance, uh, we also discuss this uh, within the electronic health record, which uh, which should be established uh, in Germany right now. So I think it's, it's very, very crucial also to educate patients continuously to enhance their competence regarding data security and data protection. And I think this is very, very important for each project. So we know that patients, they are willing to share the data, especially in public funded projects. And we also know uh, the dynamic changes are only uh, or cannot, can only be realized by having a collaboration between um, public institutions like university hospitals and also uh, the medtech companies, uh, which uh, also have the possibilities for developing new sensors and also uh, new healthcare pathways when combining these, uh, these together. And uh, I think uh, patients are willing to share, especially if they have chronic diseases. Yeah, it's sometimes been uh, been noted. I think that um, that data protection is something for citizens who are not yet patients. And uh, as soon as you develop, um, have to manage a, a chronic condition. So you you watch uh, the the world with completely new eyes. Um, so you're right there. Marta, um, it would would you like to comment on this? It has there been uh, is would you would you agree with that observation that people with diabetes um, uh, might be uh, might not have as much um, of a of a concern about uh, data protection than 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 others? Well, the people with diabetes, uh, the main concern is is to have the freedom to to live their lives. Right. <laughs> this is what the, the, the diabetic uh, the patient want, and why the, the future generation of, of diabetes solutions will be autom uh, with automatic. They won't need to bother too much on counting carbs, etc., and they can um, improve their lives without bothering on 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 what is going on with their glucose levels. Eh? Um, but the data uh, is important for them uh, because they, they want to be uh, the manager of the data. And, uh, and this is, uh, they want to um, give approval if the data will be used uh, for um, other purposes that, uh, uh, that they continue re remote monitoring purposes or of the normal research that they're the manufacturer, the provider of their services is doing, right? So, um, but for that, 
uh, of course that the patient will would like to see an approval process <laughs> and, and to give consent of the use of their data. Um, it, it, this is no doubt. But the, the, the problem, and, and uh, Christophe mentioned very well uh, with the data, is to ensure that the data is secure. And whatever transaction on sharing the data, that transaction should be, should be secure, the network, where the data will be stored should be secure, yeah? And whatever interface that produces the data sharing will be, need to be secure. So this, so cybersecurity is a, a one key element to ensure privacy, to ensure cyber, uh, confidentiality, and to ensure the, that the, the, the control of the data uh, at all times. And I also want to I also want to add that it's really in the interest of device manufacturers to be on the top standard of those cybersecurity and privacy protections because this is what really protects our services, protects our uh, ability to innovate, and we really want to have the interest of the patient at the top of the mind. So we will exactly. continue to invest in those programs um, to reassure the stakeholders. Exactly, exactly. Uh, cybersecurity should be in the center and DNA of a manufacturer <laughs> of a medical device, yeah? uh, and should be uh, part of the quality system, uh, system as well, because otherwise you cannot ensure that the, during the entire life cycle of any device, uh, the device will be secure. So it should be a constant monitoring, constant validation of data. If we use uh, a, a, AI enabled uh, um, devices, the validation of the data will needs to be constant, yeah? And uh, so, and this will be the only way to ensure that we have a high quality of uh, data and, and high quality of services as well. I think uh, on that note of quality of data that, and also cybersecurity that, that inspires trust that we are responsible stewards of data, I think uh, that is really a, a note that I would like to close this discussion on today. Um, I think this has been really useful. I want to thank all of you. I want to again thank our hosts uh, from the eHealth um, uh, Summit Portugal for this opportunity to present us. And if you have any comments or questions, please get in touch with MedTech Europe and we will be very happy to answer any more questions that you you may have. Thank you so much. Thank and you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you thank Christoph, you so Marta, bye Justine. Bye. Have a good bye one. Healthy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.